Hey everyone, thank you so much for hitting that play button. This is the Dave Bullets Podcast. Uh, really quickly, before we get to today's episode, uh, just a couple of quick things. I just want to apologize for the dead air between episodes. Uh, I know the last episode uh, with Ashley Scott Myers was it was uh, last month, and now we're releasing this one, and uh, it's actually a whole other year. Uh, but um, I, I just got caught up with things, and uh, so I, I just apologize for all that dead time. I usually have to keep a consistent schedule. It's just things have been hectic. Uh, also, I'm sick right now, so if I sound a little iffy in this episode or um, even doing this this intro right here, uh, there's a reason why. It's because I have some weird chest congestion, so thanks a lot for putting up with that. Uh, and the, the last thing before we get to today's episode is uh, I have been featured on uh, No Film School. They wrote an article about the uh, Tarantino advice that I uh, – sorry – the Tarantino video of screenwriting advice that I made, uh, I put it up on YouTube. It's the first, uh, you know, masterclass collection of advice that I ever assembled, and um, it has over two hundred thousand views right now. Uh, it, you know, it's probably my most popular video on my entire YouTube channel. And no, no film school actually wrote an entire article about the video. It is linked in the show notes. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, please you know check it out. Uh, also, if you can, just give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to subscribe to my channel while you're there, hey, why not, right? But uh, I really appreciate it, everybody, for all the continued support and all the sharing on social media. It really means a lot and also helps out this podcast. And I can keep getting you know more and more guests, et cetera, et cetera. I know you're probably sick and tired of hearing that. So without further ado... Let's get on to this week's guest. Uh, this week's guest is one of the most sought-after coaches in comedy. His first book, The Hidden Tool, uh, Tools of Comedy, was one of the uh, one of my favorite books uh, that came out in the past couple of years, and it's been an international bestseller. And his new book, which we're going to talk all about, the, the Comic Hero's Journey, is out now everywhere. I have links to all this and a ton of other notes in the show notes at DaveBullis.com. So if you really want to like dissect this episode, if you go there, I put a ton of extra stuff in there. I have charts, graphs, everything, um, just really cool stuff. So at the end of this episode, if you want to check it out, you know where to go. So without further ado, this is episode 228 with Steve Kaplan. So, Steve, you've been on twice before, and this is your third time on the podcast. How does it feel? It, it feels good. I'm, I'm still waiting for my third time uh, jacket, you know, like they do on SNL. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that's in the mail. It is, and if it gets lost, well, you know what? There's been a lot of cutbacks at the post office, Steve. So, uh, oh boy. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll continue, nevertheless. <laughs> By the way, here's a funny story for you, Steve. Really quickly, I used to work at the post office. So that explains it. They they were so desperate they hired me. Can you believe that? Right. So 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 did you experience what it meant to go postal? Well, well, see, I have an unfair advantage in that 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 part of it because I've always been like you know that unhinged <laughs> guy at work. So I kind of walked in with a chip on my shoulder. So, wow. <laughs> okay. And what what were you, what were your duties at the post office? Were you walking around, or were you behind a desk, or? Uh, neither. I actually was the guy who was in like the in the like the warehouse, and we would like sort mail. We'd move like tons of mail from here to there. We would like stock. Up. We would help like the um, actual postal workers. We'd actually like you know here's all the mail for your route today, and here's what you got to do. Um, yeah, it, it it was it was not a very glamorous job. So if you're thinking, tell me <laughs> tell me one thing that you hoped your supervisors never found out. Um. That um, I probably took – the only thing I could do, say is I took longer breaks than I should have. Um, I, I didn't like steal any mail or hide anyone's mail, nothing like that. I, never, I would never do anything like that. Um, so, so sorry, I don't have any like crazy stories. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't dump a bag of mail down like a sewer or something. But uh, did, you ever, did you ever know anybody who did? Oh, oh, stuff would go like I mean, Steve, like they used to like throw stuff across the uh, the the entire floor. So like, you know, they would take a box that says fragile and they would just boot it all the way across the whole room. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that happens on the regular. 
Okay, well, this is the basis of a new Sundance comedy. <laughs> I can I can see it now. Going postal. I thought you were going to say like a new lawsuit against the post office. I thought you were going to say I got this guy. No, no, it's everything is story. Everything is a is something to generate story. <laughs> that's that, that's very true. Uh, and, and, you know, I've seen a lot of the interviews you've done, uh, Steve, and, and not just the ones that you've done here. You know, you, you've been on twice before, but, you know, uh, you, you've been on Film Courage. Uh, you know, you've done a, a ton of interviews and, you know, you're, you're, you're very good at, you know, sort of putting comedy in perspective, which and what I mean by that is putting putting, you know, it has to be a story. There has to be a reason it's funny, because if it's just a, a series of events, it really doesn't mean a lot. Right. Well, it's it's not that it doesn't mean I've been thinking about that a, lo a lot in in the, the new book that I wrote, Comic Hero's Journey. I was thinking today that I didn't give enough props to totally silly comedies um, that that have nothing on their mind other than to be totally silly. Uh, and, and I was thinking about the fact that one of the reasons that I, I, I don't have a section on that is because it's so hard to do. Because you're not, you have nothing to hang, hang the narrative on. You don't, you, you, you kind of have characters, but they're not fully dimensionalized characters. I'm thinking of things like, like the jerk that I just recently rescreened. Um, you, you don't have a story that you really care about because you know that the, the characters are just there for laughs. And when it works, it's 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 amazing, but it's it, it's very hard to work. I can think of a lot more instances uh, where it doesn't work, like Scary Movie Four, or or um, you know Naked Gun, the, the seventh sequel, because uh, while it's possible to do, it, it's it's a very hard trick to pull off because what it means is that you are entertaining the audience in one particular way. For uh, for ninety five minutes or a hundred or hundred and five minutes, and and that's extremely difficult because you don't have a, a love story to fall back on. You don't have uh, you don't have any real tension to fall back on. There's no suspense. There's no drama. There's no there's nothing uh, thematic that hooks in. And what I found what I find is that when I go back and watch these movies like The Jerk, they don't hold up that well. I mean, for me, at least, uh, that that you, you know, having f being familiar with the comedy of it, the jokes of it, uh, I, I'm not as as uh, I'm not taken for a ride anymore. And I kind of see the shallowness of it, uh, although at the time I loved it. I, I was I was a big fan. One movie that's like that, that still works for me is Airplane. And I think the reason for that is because even though it is as silly as the day is long, you care about that Robert Hayes character. You care about him. Uh, somehow they make you, uh, you know, they, they make you concerned. They, uh, uh, they have a, uh, not, it's kind of the reverse of a save the cat. In, in drama, you have a save the cat moment. Um, in comedy, you often have uh, the cat scratches your hero's face and then, you know, then pees on his leg and then walks away. You you're made to feel sympathetic. You're made to feel bad for the for the character, and and that that makes you care. And if you care about the character, then no matter how silly the circumstances are, you're you kind of fall into the narrative. You're hooked in the narrative. So so that's what I've been thinking about. That's a that's a long answer to a question you didn't even ask. <laughs> and those are the best ones, Steve. <laughs> Trust me, because it, because it, you know people tune in to hear always hear the guests, like I always say, and it's always good to you know when the guest you know uh, you know talks more than I do, and uh, I look good too because I didn't have to ask a question; you already gave me an answer. So thank you, thank you for that, Steve. Well, there you go. So, uh, but you know what? I, I I watched the Jerk again recently. Um, you know, I still love the movie. I I absolutely think it's hilarious. But I and, and I see what you mean. Uh, but, you know, and when I watch movies like The Jerk and then you kind of compare it to today, you know, I still think The Jerk has more character development because some movies today, maybe, you know, maybe there's not so much character development or maybe there are too many, you know, there are too many jokes that really don't kind of tie in with it. Um, so, what, you know, and then that kind of ties with one of the questions I want to ask you is, you know, what what are some of the recent movies that you've seen where that have that have not only been funny 
but you also thought they were good because they actually told a story, you know, that actually focused on a character. Oh, well, um, uh, I, I would say, you know, I would say Lady Bird. Um, if you're going to go on the on the spectrum of of amusing to hilarious, Lady Bird might not be on the hilarious side of that spectrum, but it's moving. It's funny. It's true. It's authentic. Um, uh, I like uh, I liked the uh, Grand Budapest Hotel. Again, it's it's just this perfect little fairy tale uh, that has uh, very exaggerated characters, but ultimately it's it's about uh, it's about honor and integrity in a strange way because it's about this maitre d who you know who screws all the all the elder uh, guests at the hotel um, but it, it, in a strange way it, it's it's about uh, holding on to something that's valuable from the past and and mourning the things that are lost um, uh, in in terms of movies that I, I thought I thought were just funny, uh, I thought Spy was very successful. Uh, in terms of uh, parodying that James Bond formula and yet finding its own comedy in in, uh, in what Melissa McCarthy does. So uh, so I think uh, let me see. Was there something? Uh, you know, most of the comedy that I see today aren't aren't movie. You know, successful comedies uh, aren't movies as much as as what you see on television, um, and and especially on this on the streaming channels. Um, uh, Brockmire uh, is uh, <laughs> is a binge worthy favorite of mine. Uh, it's because I love baseball and I love Hank Azaria, and he just takes this dissolute character to its ultimate illogical, logical conclusion. And it makes sense. It's um, him, uh, Hank Azaria, uh, Amanda Peet, uh, great stuff, very funny. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, marvelous uh, Mrs. Maisel, is it, did I pronounce that right? I can never figure that, that out. Uh, I, I'm just starting to watch uh, season two. Uh, so that that's very good. I. Uh, I think it's hard to it's hard to do uh, feature comedy uh, because the because the the marketplace kind of demands them to dumb down their material. So you have something like um, have you seen Tag? Right, I've seen Tag. So I, I don't know what you thought of Tag, but I thought that that it it's kind of an an odd quirky story that I couldn't see the reason why they made it into a movie because even though there were some funny things that happened uh, it it kind of eluded me maybe you had a different experience but I, I find that uh, a lot of what gets into the theaters is something that they're condescending to the audience they're thinking well this is funny they'll like it as opposed to what, what's the best story we can tell and what's the most comic way we can tell it yeah i i, I saw tag and uh i i it's again i kind of felt that way too it's kind of like you know how did this you know get made into a movie it's kind of like one of those things where like they made you you kind of see the poster and you're like well maybe it could be good you know and then you and then it's kind of like you know they made this into a movie um, I'm sure there was a, a, a market for it. Um, I don't know how well it did. I really I, I don't have the numbers, but um, I don't know. I, I don't think there's going to be a sequel. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I, you know, in, in a way, sometimes the best comedies nowadays are the animated comedies because they're uh, they they're creating, uh, especially the Pixar comedies, they're creating material that has to be four quadrant, that has to appeal towards everybody. So it can't just be silly jokes that the kids like. There has to be something for the parents. They want something for the parents. And those Pixar movies are all uh, driven thematically as opposed to uh, driven by plot and gag. Uh, so Incredibles 2, uh, uh, Coco, is that, was, that, uh, was that the one with um, Day of the Dead? I think that's I think I'm getting that right. Um, yeah, I think that was Coco. Yeah. I mean, those are those are wonderful, inventive, imaginative and 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 moving, uh, moving pieces of, uh, of comic uh, film. Um, 
and I guess I guess there's the sense because it's not R rated uh, that they can just tell a story and they're not beholden to do something outrageous or gross every ten minutes to keep this imaginary audience of thirteen year old boys happy. <laughs> so you know you you mentioned uh, Brockmeyer. I've never seen an episode. Uh, but I have a friend who swears by it because uh, he he just loves Hank Azaria as well. But you know, speaking of baseball shows, have you ever seen Eastbound and Down? I do like Eastbound and Down, and the thing is, is that um, I, I I like Eastbound and Down. I like Danny McBride, and if you pe- put the two of them together, the thing that I like more about Brockmeyer is that it it expands the 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 envelope of what's what could be what could actually have have happened and it doesn't break the envelope. Whereas with uh, Eastbound and Down, you often have to just leave your your good sense off to one side and just to just enjoy Danny McBride as this outrageous, uh, not too bright ex baseball player. So those are actually two similar projects which I think one is is done better. Mm-hmm. But but both both have both have amusing things. I mean, you know, for me, uh, you uh, you start with the hardest question for me, Dave, which is, what have you seen that you like? Uh, which makes me feel obligated to, well, what's what did I like that's good? But taste is subjective. That's one of the things that I I I teach strongly in, in my workshops and my books is that is that funny is subjective. I mean, what I find funny, you might not find funny. It doesn't make me right and you wrong or vice versa. So you, so if you're not going to try to create funny, what's going to make me laugh as opposed to what's going to make you laugh, then you, then you want to try to create comedy, which is telling the truth about people, what's true about people, and telling the truth about that using you know, a, a variety of, of methods that, that make it, that bring it out of the mundane and the ordinary and, and elevate it to, to comic, kind of comic art and comic truth. So, uh, so if you, if you ask me, what, what have I seen that I, I really like, uh, I'm, I, I'm really drawn to, to movies that I've seen years ago that I, st- that still stay with me. Uh, like, um, about a boy or 500 days of summer movies that are funny but they have something on their mind and they they move me uh they move me in three ways they move me uh kinetically i laugh they move me emotionally i feel and they move me intellectually i think uh and to me those are the best movies and to me uh, i still um i i still go to my favorite which is groundhog day and I guess my second favorite might be Forty Year Old Virgin, which I just spent uh, uh, a day screening for a class in in Milan, uh, te- tr- trying to teach them um, uh, how it works in terms of the comic hero's journey. So uh, when you screen that, by the way, those are two very good choices. By the way, uh, thank you. So because uh, you know Groundhog's Day, uh, you know we could we could dissect that right now, but. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's it's such a great movie because you know repeating the same day over and over, and eventually you're right. I, I think you touched upon this in an interview before. Maybe you and I talked about this, but where he kind of assumes that he's God and he kind of assumes these things. That's how people would have really, you know, you, that's how if that happened to you or me, you would assume that same thing. Right. I mean, and that's that's really the the brilliance of the Harold Ramis revision. Of the originally Dan, of the original Danny Rubin script is that uh, uh, in, in at least in the final shooting version uh, they he he kind of uh, holds very closely to okay this impossible thing happened that he's waking up and it's the same day over and over again but having having uh, admitted that having just uh, gone along and said okay this impossible thing happened. What would happen then if this were true? What would really happen out of that? And and I think one of the things that makes Groundhog Day work so well is that is that even though incredible, weird, funny things happen, it stays within the reality of the impossible situation that they created. Uh, he 
wakes up the same day, he remembers everything, nobody remembers anything. So he can go to a girl and and try to pick her up. And if he makes, uh, if he says something wrong and uh, turns her off, he can come back the next day and uh, and make it better. So she'll say, what should we toast to? And uh, he'll, you know, he's at a bar and he'll say, let's toast to the groundhog. And she kind of gets turned off by that. So he comes back the very next day and she says, what should we toast to? And he turns all solemn and he says, I'd like to say a, a word for, you know, a prayer for world peace. And, and of, of course, because he figures, having gone through trial and error, he knows that that will, that will endear himself to her. So, I, you know, I, I like the fact that it takes an impossible or improbable situation, which in, in, in my book I call the WTF moment, the what the fuck moment. Um, and, and after that, everything that happens after that evolves organically and honestly out of character uh, guided by theme. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's kind of like every guy's dream, right? You have a, a unlimited chances to actually pick up a girl, right? So, right. <laughs> but uh, but no, it, it's it's uh, it's like those days, you know. And at the heart of Groundhog's Day was, you know, is basically, you know, he had to find out what was missing in his life, and and basically, you know, find out all the mistakes that he was making, and you know, even when he thought he had the perfect day. He would. He remember. He woke up again, and he goes, "What the hell? I, I thought I did. You know, I got. I did all this right." And he he still didn't wake up. And then finally, as it, it progressed, it was it, he had to. Uh, I forget the uh, uh, the female character's name in there that he ended up with at the end. Rita. But, yeah, Rita. Right, right. right. Andy, uh, Rita played by Andy McDowell. Right. Well, I remember his name was Phil because I remember that guy was like, "Hey, Phil, like the groundhog." Yeah, I remember, exactly. <laughs> see, it stuck with me. It's like a, a, a mnemonic device, but. Um, and then you have Forty Year Old Virgin, which you know I, I think you know again that's brilliant. Especially you know I mean it's probably even more true today than it was when it was made even a few years ago because you got a lot of millennials still living at you know they you know what I mean they still living at home. That's, it, that's true. That's true. But I think uh, for me the the thing the the brilliance of of the Apatow film is the brilliant combination and and and. Uh, and the balance between gross-out humor and real heart, uh, where whereas before you had lots of films, you know, like those uh, uh, Rob Schneider films, which were just basically how can we be grosser than the Farrelly brothers and and get away with it and, and get some laughs. But what Judd Apatow did is he he kind of hit the sweet spot between a, cons- you know, a, a conservative sentimental story and uh, you know balls to the wall uh, gross out humor. Uh, and and in fact, in, in, in talking about the film, he, he, he often talks about the fact that there were things he cut out because they lost the audience. They might have gotten some laughs from some from some people, but, uh, if he sh- when he showed it to the audience, for instance, there were there was much more pornography, uh, literal pornography uh, that that they were uh, looking at uh, on the screens because they were in this uh, you know the True Tech or whatever the name uh, Smart Tech was the electronic store, and there was a sequence in which they lock Andy, which is played by Steve Carell, in the in the booth where you could test out you know sound systems. And they locked him in there with a pornographic film to get him, you know, out of his, I don't know, virgin dumb. And in the in one of the original cuts, uh, there was a lot more uh, porno film in it. And in fact, I, I this is a very this is a very uh, uh, I think uh, odd point, but the actress in the porno film I think is Stormy Daniels. Uh, I. <laughs> I, you could check me on that, but I think that that's Stormy Daniels in there. Uh, and and what they found at a at a test screening was that it was funny, it got a laugh, but it lost the audience because you know maybe they were a little uncomfortable, or maybe they just thought, oh, is this the movie we're going to watch now? It's it's going to be as you know more gross and more gross and more gross, grosser and grosser. As opposed to dumber and dumber, 
Um, and so he he edited that out and he trimmed it and he took out the part that that pushed the audience away, not offended the audience, but pushed them out of the narrative, pushed them out of the caring about the character. Uh, and 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 so to me, one of the one of the wonderful things about the movie is that right when you think, oh, now they're going to really make fun of this character and they're going to mock him. You empathize with him. You sympathize with him. You feel bad for him. After after it's revealed that he's a virgin at the poker game, uh, there's not a sequence where he's like doing something dumb. He's he's riding his bike home in pain, in agony. The first thing you see when he gets to his apartment is a shot of him screaming like this primal scream of pain and humiliation. And the result of that is that you're thinking, oh, my God, this isn't just a joke that's supposed to last for um, 90 minutes. This is a human being who's ha who's, you know, has this improbable. I go back to impossible or improbable, this improbable thing. He's 40 years old. He's still a virgin. It's not impossible, but it's improbable. And what would happen? What would he do? And and the guys at the at the at Smart Tech, they don't just make they don't make fun of him. Some of them do. Some minor characters who we see for a second, but the main three buddies, uh, Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, and Romney Malco, they're out to help him. It's actually a very heartwarming uh, and an inclusive movie uh, about about growing up and trans transformation. So so to me, those those are movies. When I go to the movies and I see something that's um, not uh, not really a a, uh, a transcendent experience, I, I often have to go and watch something else that I think I think is, and it could be something as uh, as classic as Shop Around the Corner, or uh, You've Got Mail, which is the same story but updated, or um, it's a Wonderful Life or Meet Me in St. Louis. Uh, these stories that combine comedy with heart and, and, and a point of view and, and an idea in, in their head. You know, you, you mentioned the uh, Fairley Brothers. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, by the way, is Dumb and Dumber. Um, and, uh, you know, because you also mentioned Dumb and Dumber. I don't know if you meant that on purpose, but uh, uh, you know what I mean? And, and so I, I just wanted to say, what do you, what do you think of Dumb and Dumber? I, th I think it's one of the things that when I when I talked about movies that are just kind of designed to make you laugh and not not a lot else, that's one of the movies that succeeds wonderfully because they they have this silly premise where these two dumb guys are going to go on this road trip and they just keep on finding inventive ways to keep it fresh. And one of the ways that they do it is by uh, at, at any one point, one of them, one of the dumb guys, is slightly more aware and smarter than the others. So it's this wonderful Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy routine all the way throughout, but they but they switch it enough so that it doesn't become repetitive or predictable. So I I I, I love I love Dumb and Dumber, um, and uh, and I think it's. Um, it's it's one of the it's one of the few movies that I think tries to be funny from beginning to end and then succeeds. But it's really, really hard. And if and if you want proof of how hard it is, take a look at the Farrelly Brothers Three Stooges, which is, you know, the listen, these are the same guys. They're talented guys. Um, Bobby read my book and wrote me a nice note about it, which I like, you know, which I liked. But. Uh, the Three Stooges it only works sporadically because there's not you know because there's really no story other than hey we're doing the Three Stooges um, and and it's got some silly plot but you don't really care about them the way you care about uh, the characters in Dumb and Dumber or or more uh, even more the characters in There's Something About Mary. Yeah, and, and you know that's kind of one of the the hardest things to do for writers, right? Is to create empathy for a character, so so the audience, 
you know, they, they not only, they don't sympathize, but, you know, uh, sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody, but empathy is putting yourself into their shoes so you can see things from their point of view. And that's kind of one of the hardest things that I, that I think for writers to do because – and it's what Pixar does so well, which is you know right off the bat caring about characters, getting involved in their story so you actually give a damn if they succeed, if they succeed or not. Well, in, in a way, it's actually the easiest thing to do because all you have to do is tell your own story. One of the things that Pixar does so well is they spend so much time on story and they're willing to throw out – years of work, hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of work in order to get the story right. Um, uh, in, in Inside Out, for instance, uh, at first it was going to be uh, joy, the character of joy and fear going on that journey. And, and they, they spent a lot of time trying to make that work, and it didn't work. Uh, and ultimately they had to go, they had to realize that what joy needs is her opposite. Joy needs sadness. And the way you get there is not by intellectualizing, by going, you know, what I think joy should be. What you, do, what you, how you get there is by sharing your own feelings, sharing your own sense of, uh, of what's happened to you as a person. Uh, I, I, I can't remember exactly who on the creative team uh, it was, but somebody had the experience of leaving Minnesota uh, and and going to a new city as a kid. And that became the movie. So it's not a matter of how can you make a character empathetic. Tell your own story. Be honest. In, in, in the fictional, in that fictional world, tell your own story. Somebody once said that all fiction is autobiography. Uh, every piece of fiction is back, is actually telling you more about the person who's writing it then about the characters who are in it. Um, and, and I think that's true. So uh, in, uh, in there's something about Mary, there's this wonderful moment. It's not the first moment in the film, but it's one of the flashback moments when we see Ben Stiller a as a teenager with really terrible braces, uh, go to pick Mary up for the prom and the, and he rings the doorbell and, um, uh, this uh, the door opens and uh, I forget the name of the actor, but the actor is Keith African David. Uh, Keith David, right? Keith David uh, opens the door, and, and you know Mary's not African American, so he's confused for a second. So he kind of peeks up at the door number for a second, and then the guy says, "What are you here for?" And he says, "I'm here to pick up Mary for the prom." And Keith David, because Keith David's this practical joke, he says, "Oh, Mary went to the prom 20 minutes ago with her boyfriend Woogie." And there's this moment where you see Ben Stiller's face just, just you know, fall apart. You know, he's and he, he's trying, you know, he's trying to hold it together and just goes kind of okay. And he's about to walk away. And yes, uh, then the mom comes in and says, "Oh, he's kidding. Come on in." But in that moment, we confronted all our disappointments from adolescence. Everybody who's ever stood up or, or didn't have a date or, or had a bad date or was or was, or was passed over uh, for being picked for volleyball, you know, we we all empathize with that moment. And it's not save the cat. It's basically the cat scratched me and 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 it's a universal feeling. So what happens what happens in a comedy is you want to make sure that the the more the more exaggerated and ridiculous uh, event that's going to happen later on in the movie, that means that you have to be more honest and real earlier in the movie to make us care, make us care. Because eventually later on in that scene, uh, Ben Stiller uh, finds himself in a bathroom and he zips up too quickly and he catches a very important appendage in a zipper. Uh, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's it's just you know flat out silly. But if we don't care about the character, that's all it is. It's just silly, as opposed to us us kind of putting ourselves in his shoes and going, man, what else what else wrong could happen today? <laughs> and and basically, you know, like you always said, Steve, uh, the the uh, in like an action movie, the hero has all the tools. 
but in but in a comedy, the hero has no tools whatsoever. Or well, the not not no tools, but the hero lacks some, if not most of the tools. I mean, uh, Woody Allen's very very witty and very bright, but he's a physical coward. So you can't you, you can't be a total. N- normally, it can't be a total loser, but but somebody who lacks some, if not if not all the skills. I mean, one of the in, in working on the comic hero's journey, which was taking a look at the hero's journey uh, from a comedy point of view, one of the things that we that we came to in the beginning was the fact that in in a in 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 a drama in an action film, the the hero has all the skills necessary. Sometimes they're hidden within. They have greatness hidden within. Only they don't know it. Perhaps like Luke Skywalker. But in a comedy. Your character starts the movie off with, with, there's no greatness within. There is far from greatness within as is humanly possible. And basically, the story of a comedy is a story of a character who is comfortable, used to, has, has resigned themselves to being this imperfect person. In fact, most of the times they don't even know that they're imperfect. And something, some impossible or improbable thing happens to push them out of their comfort zone, and they're forced to transform, and they do transform because they because like in uh, Big, where he, he wakes up, he's thirty years old. In Groundhog Day, he's waking up; it's the same day over and over again. There's no choice but to transform because their circumstances have changed, uh, so that their our characters in a comedy become somebody who is is a more actualized human being it, it, it has more skills but they start off as big zeros uh, what we call you know take you know taking your zero and making them into a hero right and, and to go along with what you just said you know um you're right i, I misspoke when i said lack of lack of uh, skills or has no or sorry it has zero skills because you have to have at least one trait for the audience yeah. to be like maybe this guy has a shot at something yeah yeah. So, so uh, you know, you, see, that's where my head's at, Steve. I'm always like, look, just let's just give them nothing and go from. Let's go from. No, the- no, no. <laughs> give, give them something. I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, in in bridesmaids, uh, Kristen Wiig is, is 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 totally messed up, but at least she has a good best friend in Maya Rudolph. Um, even even though she doesn't have a job and she doesn't have a boyfriend, and and John Hamm is terrible to her. So 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 our our heroes. Our comic heroes start off with something, but most of the time that they're 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 not aware of how of of how bad their predicament is, or how uh, what what their what their minus is, their negative is, um, and and most of the times our comic heroes uh, start off with a short sighted goal, um, you know. Uh, Bill Murray in Groundhog Day only wants to get a job at a at a bigger station where he can be a newscaster. Um, uh, Steve Carell in in the Forty Year Old Virgin only he just wants to continue what he thinks is a great life. You know he makes an omelet every morning by himself and he plays with his uh, dolls and he he has all his uh, his his merchandise still in the original packaging and he watches survivor with the elderly couple upstairs. He he's to him. That's okay. I'm not, he's not, he doesn't complain and he's not even totally conscious that he's, that he's unhappy. But what happens as our characters transform is they get what, what we call the discovered goal that in comedies, our characters discover a goal halfway through midway through that, that, that then becomes their ultimate goal, their, their outer goal in order to uh, accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish in the in the movie. Because like in 40-Year-Old Virgin, you know, if if it were to be like, let's just say, you know, real life, and, and you know, that main character never, ever realized how unhappy he was. You know, he was always 40. Uh, he was always just going to do the same old thing. Essentially, you could see that, that he would never change his routine and he would just kind of, you know, die, so to speak, physically, and it was just surrounded by that stuff, and he would never yeah. know there was an issue. Yeah. So, and then again, when, when just going back to the four-year-old virgin, when 
when uh, his whole goal was just to get laid at first, and then he realizes he he's found somebody he actually loves by the by uh, the end. Right. So, so and the first thing he says is, "I respect women. I totally respect women. I respect them so much. I I stay the hell away from them." And <laughs> and, and then later on, it's like, "No, I don't want to go to bed with the girl from the bookstore. I I I love Trish, um, uh, played by Catherine Keener. I I and and he he does something." which is way outside his comfort zone. He races after her on his bike uh, to, you know, to get the girl of his dream. So, so there, there are a lot of, there are some similarities between the hero's journey and the comic hero's journey. Um, you, you know, you often at the end of an action film, you have the, the, the race to the finish uh, in, in a comedy. You're have, you're seeing a character transform, uh, go from, uh, you know, uh, a, a a zero to a mensch, and a mensch is a Yiddish word that means like a good man, um, a, a a complete person, and and so uh, in, in an action film, Bruce Willis is going to kick ass from the minute he shows up on screen screen to the end, but our heroes in a, in a comedy, uh, they're not going to kick ass in the beginning. They have to learn. They have to. Uh, gain skills, they have to uh, gather allies, and they have to become uh, m- better better human beings in, in, in the world, uh, more, more comfortable, uh, more integrated in, into the world that, that they live in. Right, and, and you know we, we've kind of been you know talking sort of uh, in a roundabout way about the comic hero's journey. So let's talk about your new book. So hey, actually... that's my new book. That's funny. <laughs> funny you should mention that. That's my new book, The Comic Hero's Journey: Serious Story Structure for Fabulously Funny Films. Now uh, uh, published by Michael Weese Productions. Now available in your local Amazon. Well, you know it's funny. I looked down by my foot, and there it was, just sitting there. I was like, Hey, wait a minute here. How did, how did, how did this get here? Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we, we've been, uh, you know, talking, you know, in a roundabout way about, you know, uh, creating characters and, and, you know, finding out their, their sort of wants and needs and goals. And, you know, so what was sort of the impetus for you to sort of write this book, uh, you know, for, for the, uh, the comic hero's journey? Well, uh, I had been, uh, I had written, um, my previous book, the hidden tools of comedy, which was, which were specific tools and principles that you could apply towards film or television. And I would be teaching these workshops and people would say, would say, well, how would this happen at this part in the movie? And it just made me think, okay, uh, there are all these books and, and, and uh, about story structure. And, and a lot of my friends have written books about story structure, like um, Michael Haig and, 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 and John Truby. Uh, and Chris Vogler, and I thought, well, well, is that you know, how are the how is that story structure that the the three act format or the six uh, p- um, you know plot point turning format? How does that work for comedy? So I started to explore that, and I realized some of it is similar, but there are important elements that are completely different. Um, and that that are different uh, in a comedy than than in uh, than in a uh, dramatic or, or action film. And so I started working on it. And I started uh, and I I pitched it to my publisher, and I uh, I mentioned it to Chris Vogler, who's written the the you know the writer's journey, which is based on the Joseph Campbell work, uh, the monomyth and the hero with uh, of a thousand faces. And I said, uh, Chris, do you mind? I'm going to steal your title and, and your idea. I'm going to use it for comedy. And, and after a moment, he said, OK, only only uh, only mention me uh, as you're doing it. So I did. And so I and so this is uh, a template for writing a comic feature. It's not it's not the only way to write a comic feature. It's not uh, the uh, the end all and be all of of how to structure a story but it's one way of taking a look at the hero's journey and seeing how that that monomyth works uh for comedy and and the the i think one of the big differences is understanding that your hero starts off 
at, at a loss, you know, that we've talked about and understanding that the funny thing that happens to them, that that uh, what we call the comic premise, the impossible or improbable thing is the only time uh, in in the story that you can make shit up, that you can lie, that after you impose that impossible or improbable event or or happenstance, then you have to play honestly, develop the develop the narrative honestly through character and through theme. Um, uh, we talk about the fact that that characters are transforming; and they have a discovered goal, uh, and then we talk about the fact that, uh, and this is, uh, th to me, this is almost. Uh, it goes without saying, but I found out that uh, that it was a little bit of a revelation to people that I was working with or, or talking to in, in workshops is that in order for the comic hero's journey to work, there has to be real pain and real loss. There has to be there has to be honest moments where where you where you drop into drop into drama. Otherwise, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything it doesn't matter um so so that's that's a, a part of the of the comic hero's journey that's essential for comedies and i can't think of a good comedy in which there isn't some moment where where all where the healer where all is lost you know the uh, the the hero seems that they've given up that they're not going to achieve their goals that that the story is not going to end end happily, and it doesn't mean you have to have a happy ending, but it does mean that you have to allow your character to experience not funny loss and pain, but real loss and pain. Right. So, so there actually has to be some real stakes, some actual losses. So, you know what I mean. So, it has to feel like you. you feel real and feel that there's actually something at stake here rather than just kind of like going, Oh, well, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll work out. Or, or it's all silly. So don't worry about it. It, <laughs> it, it can't be, a, it can't be a Bugs Bunny cartoon where, where you shoot bugs in the face with a shotgun and, and Hey, there's when the smoke clears, he just has a, you know, a bad complexion, but everything else is okay. So, <laughs> so one of the, one of the things that I've noticed in, in e examining a lot of movies to write the book is not only are there moments of loss and pain uh, near three quarters of the way through, but a lot of movies start off with the characters having uh, having dealt with loss and pain or, or dealing with loss and pain, starting with you know, Sleepless in Seattle, where it starts off following the death of Tom Hanks' wife, and now he's a widow, or, or, or Spy with Melissa McCarthy, where... In the first uh, ten minutes, uh, the hero of the movie, her the person she idolizes, Jude Law, who's this very James Bondian kind of spy, is is killed. Spoiler spoiler alert! Seemingly killed um, right in, right in front of her uh, ears because she's she's monitoring everything back back in Langley, Virginia. Um, that that a lot of the comedy comes out of real loss and pain as opposed to, well, it's a comedy, so nothing serious can really happen. You know, and, and there's a, you know, it was a great example was the hangover uh, because you, you, you kind of felt uh, some actual pressure there. And that, you know what right. I mean? Cause, cause Hey, look, there's a groom that we have to find because, you know, and we're the guys that lost them. Right. Uh, actually, I, I like parts of The Hangover, but I wasn't crazy about The Hangover, precisely because uh, those the you know especially the uh, Bradley Cooper character was so uh, amoral. Is like this teacher who's drinking, and let's just go off and do this thing, and let's just party. Um, and their relation, none of their relationships. I mean, certainly the um, uh, who's the guy who lost the tooth? Uh, Ed Holmes. Right, the Ed Helms character. His his relationship is horrible. You don't want him to end up with her. <laughs> so, so, so one of the things that 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 I was not crazy about in The Hangover was the lack of um, uh, of empathetic characters and and and, and thematic uh, thematic development and resolution. 
But what was brilliant about The Hangover was how it melded a frat boy Las Vegas movie with a mystery. And to me, that was that was what what made it very special is that once you woke up and there's a baby and a tiger and how the hell did those things get there? Everything else worked because they had to they had to go on this this mystery. You had to solve this this impossible mystery. And the way that they did that, uh, uh, you know, led them into funnier and funnier situations. For me, the funniest moment is when the. Uh, I think it's Ken Young, uh, the naked Asian guy jumps out of the trunk of the car. That was funny, but but my, the the most satisfying moment of the movie uh, was the was the credits where you see the night, you know, in all those photographs, you see the night that they went through, and and because at the heart of the Hangover is a gag, that's why Hangovers two and three, while they might have made money, were aesthetically not very satisfying for me at least because there's nothing there i you know i don't really care about those guys uh and and the only guy i might want to care about uh was uh in hangover was basically uh on on a roof uh lost for for most of the movie so 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 i i i have to be a um uh somebody who is uh on the don't love hangover side. Well, but I, you're still a great guy, Dave. You're still a wonderful guy, nevertheless. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm going to hold you to that, Steve. By the way, okay. <laughs> it, it, well, I, I agree. The, the the hangover sequels. I, 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 and you know this too. When whenever there's a hit movie, you know, the, there's an inclination in Hollywood to say, hey, you know, let's start churning out those sequels. You know, let's Hangover 17 sounds good to me. Right. <laughs> But then again, you know, if I was in a position where somebody was like, "Hey, look, Dave, you, if you if you make a hit movie, we'll give you a couple million to write the sequel," I'd be like, "You know what? I'm going to write till my hand falls off." You know, I think <laughs> I, I think I'm with you there. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, I'll, I will, I'll be in my grave writing sequels to that movie as long as you're writing checks. But <laughs> hey, hey, there's there's a comedy idea right there, Steve. There's a comedy story somewhere in there. There's a comedy story everywhere. That's that's the whole point. Uh, our lives are comedies, and we just have to be brave enough to tell them. Yeah, and, and you know that's a very good point, Steve. And uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and that's why I, I made sure to pick up your book, uh, your you know your other book, uh, The Hidden Tools of Comedy. Um, by the way, just as a quick side note, the other two episodes of the of the podcast where you're on, Steve, they do phenomenal numbers still to this day. Wow. Uh, yeah. So uh, so a year and and a year and a half, respectively. Uh, are still doing great numbers. Like uh, you know, when I when I pull like a, a three month kind of window of of the past downloads, you're always in there. Wow, that's great. Well, then we should let people know how to get in touch with me. Uh, where can people find you at, Steve? People can find me at my website, which is www. Kaplan with a K. Kaplan Comedy Comedy with the C. Kaplan Comedy, all one word. KaplanComedy dot com, or they can email me at Steve at KaplanComedy dot com. Or they can friend me on uh, uh, Facebook um, at uh, uh, Kaplan Comedy, and or or they can uh, follow me on Twitter at SK Comedy. And I'm going to link to all that in the show notes, everyone, including a link to Amazon to buy uh, Steve's new book, The Comic Hero's Journey, and his other book, by the way, uh, The Hidden Co- The Hidden Tools of Comedy. Did I say the, the hidden tools of comedy? Well, you said the hidden cool of comedy, which I like even better. <laughs> I, I was like, wait, it didn't sound right. Wait, <laughs> the next printing—that's the—that's going to be the new title. Wow, I think I think I just gave you your next uh, your next book, Steve. The hidden I, cool I, of comedy. I, I, I'm working on that right now. <laughs> And I'm going to link to, to everything we talked about in the show notes, everyone, right. at DaveBullis.com. Uh, Twitter, it's at DB Podcast. Steve Kaplan, as always, man, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Dave. And and be on the lookout for that jacket in the mail, by the way. Okay. Uh, third time jacket. You know, uh, there's, there aren't a lot of us here. There's not. It's a rare club, Steve. Okay. <laughs> I, I feel honored. <laughs> Have a good one, buddy. You too. Thanks, Dave. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.